Chapter 5, Part 1 of Sounder by William H. Armstrong. Illustrated by James Barkley. The boy moved quickly around the corner and out of sight of the iron door and the gray cement walls of the jail. At the wall in front of the courthouse, he stood for a while and looked back. When he had come, he was afraid, but he felt good in one way because he would see his father. He was bringing him a cake for Christmas, and he wasn't going to let his father know he was grieved, so his father wouldn't be grieved. Now the sun had lost its strength. There were only a few people loafing around the courthouse wall, so the boy sat for a spell. He felt numb and tired. What would he say to his mother? He would tell her that the jailer was mean to visitors, but didn't say nothing to the people in jail. He wouldn't tell her about the cake. When he told her his father had said she shouldn't send him again, that he would send word by the visiting preacher, she would say, you grieved him, child. I know you. I told you to be perk, so you wouldn't grieve him. Nobody came near where the boy sat or passed in the street in front of the wall. He had forgotten the most important thing, he thought. He hadn't asked his father where Sounder had come to him on the road when he wasn't more more a pup. That didn't make any difference. But along the road on the way to the jail, before the bullneck man had ruined everything, the boy had thought his father would begin to think and say, If a stray ever follow you and it wasn't near a house, likely somebody's dropped it. So you could fetch it home or keep it. Or a dog. Wouldn't do good, no good now, the boy murmured to himself. Even if he found a stray on the way home, his mother would say, I'm afraid, child. Don't bring... Don't bring it in the cabin. If it's still here when morning comes, you take it down the road and scold it and run it so it won't fall here no more. If somebody come looking, you'd be in awful trouble. A great part of the way home, the boy walked in darkness. In the big houses, he saw beautiful lights and candles in the windows. Several times, Dog rushed to the front gates and barked as he passed. But no stray pup came to him along the lonely, empty stretches of road. In the dark, he thought of the bull-necked man crumpled on the floor in the cake crumbs, like a strangled bull in the cattle chute, and he walked faster. At one big house, the mailbox by the road had a lighted lantern hanging on it. The boy walked on the far side of the road so he wouldn't show in the light. People hangs them out when companies are coming at night, the boy's father had told him, once told him. When, the, when court was over, they would take his father to a road camp or a quarry or a state farm. Would his father send word with the visiting preacher where he had gone? Would they take his father away to the chain gang for a year or two years before he could tell the visiting preacher? How would the boy find him then? If he lived closer to town, he could watch each day. And when his father, when they took his father away in the wagons where convicts were penned up in huge wooden crates, he could follow. The younger children were already in bed when the boy got home. He was glad, for they would have asked a lot of questions that might make his mother feel bad. Questions like, is everybody chained up in jail? Or how long do people stay in that jail at one time? The boy's mother did not ask her for questions. She asked if the boy got in all right and if it was warm in the jail. The boy told her the jailer was mean to visitors but that he didn't say nothing to the people in jail. He told her he heard some people singing in jail. Sounder ain't come home, the boy said to his mother after he talked, had talked about the jail. He had come, he had looked under the porch and called before he came into the cabin. Now he went out calling and looking around the whole cabin. He started to light the lantern to look more, but his mother said, hang it back, child. Ain't no use to fret yourself. Eat your supper. You must be famished. He said not to come no more, the boy finally said to his mother when he finished the supper. He said he'll send word by the visiting preacher. He poked up the fire and waited for his mother to ask him if he'd been perk 
and didn't grieve his father, but she didn't. He warmed himself and watched a patch of red glow the size of his hand at the bottom of the stove. He could see the red-faced man, faced man laying on the jail floor with blood oozing out of the corners of his mouth. After a long, quiet spell, the rocker began to squeak, and it made the boy jump. But his mother didn't notice. She began to rock as she picked out the walnut kernels. She hummed for a while, and then she began to sing like she was almost whispering for no one to hear but herself. You gotta walk that lonesome valley. You gotta walk that lonesome valley. You gotta walk it by yourself. Ain't nobody else gonna walk it for you. In bed, the pressure of the bed slats through the straw tick felt good against the boy's body. The pillow smelled fresh, and it was smooth and soft. He was tired but he lay awake for a long time. He thought of the store windows full of so many things. He thought of the beautiful candles on the windows. He dreamed his father's hands were chained against the prison bars and he was still standing there with his head down. He dreamed that a wonderful man had come up to him as he was trying to read the store signs aloud and had said, child, you want to learn, don't you? In the morning, the boy, the boy lay listening to his mother as she opened and closed the store, the stove door. She heard the damper squeak on the stovepipe as she adjusted it. She was singing softly to herself. Then the boy thought he heard his mo another familiar voice, a faint whine on the cabin porch. He listened. No, it couldn't be. Sound were always scratched before he whined, and the scratching was always louder than the whine. Besides, it was almost two months later, and the boy's mother had said he might be back in a week. No, he was not dreaming. He heard it again. He had been sleeping in his shirt to keep warm, so he only had to pull his, on his overalls as he went. His mother had stopped singing and was listening. There, on the other cabin porch, there on the cabin porch, on three legs, stuck, stood the living skeleton of what had been a mighty coon hound. The tail began to wag and the hide made little ripples back and forth over the ribs. One side of his head and shoulders was reddish brown and hairless. The acid of the oak leaves had tanned the surface of the wound, the color of leather. One foot dangled above the floor. The stub of an ear stuck out on one side and there was no eye in this, that side, only a dark socket with a splinter of a bone showing above it. The dog raised his good ear and whined. His one eye looked up at the lantern and at the possum sack where they hung against the wall. The eye looked past the boy and his mother. Where was his master? Poor creature. Poor creature, said the mother and turned away to get him food. The boy felt sick and wanted to cry, but he touched Sounder on the, his good side of his head. The tail wagged faster and he licked the boy's hand. The shatter, shattered shoulder never grew together enough to carry weight. So the great hunter with a single eye, his head held to one side so he could see, never hopped much farther from the cabin than the spot in the road where he had tried to jump on the wagon with his master. Whether he lay in the sun on the cabin porch or by the side of the road, the one eye always turned in the direction his master had gone. The boy got used to the way the great dog looked the stub of the ear didn't bother him, and the one eye that looked at, up at him was warm and questioning. But why couldn't he bark? He wasn't hit in the neck, the boy would say to his mother. He eats all right, and his throat ain't scarred. But day after day, when the boy snapped his fingers and said, Sounder, good sounder, no exciting bark burst from his great throat. When something moved at night, he whined. his whine was louder, but it was still just a whine. Before Sounder was shot, the boy's mother always said, get the pan, child, or feed your dog, child. Now she sometimes got the pan herself and took out, took food out to Sounder. The boy noticed that sometimes his mother would stop singing when she put the food pan down at the edge of the porch. Sometimes she would stand and look at the hunting lantern and the possum sack where they hung unused against the cabin wall. That's it for today.